All right. So you wanted to take a deep dive into the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act. And while we're ready to go, you sent over some of those key excerpts from the European Parliament's document, the one they passed earlier this year. And we're going to unpack those for you. We'll be looking at the core values that are really driving this legislation, how the EU goes about defining high-risk AI, and uh, we'll also touch on some of the things that surprised us as we were going through all of this. You know, it's really interesting to see how the EU approaches this whole thing because they dive right into the heart of the matter, yeah, not right. shying away from the impact AI could have, good and bad. Right from the get-go, they emphasize the importance of finding that balance, you know, keeping innovation thriving while making absolutely sure that fundamental rights are protected. Yeah, it's like they're establishing this whole new set of ground rules for a playing field that's constantly changing, right? Exactly. And they're not just like throwing out these vague ideas. They're specifically tying this whole approach back to something very concrete, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Absolutely. That's a key point. Hmm. It's all about making sure that as AI develops, it lines up with the core values the EU really prioritizes things like human dignity, transparency, non-discrimination. We're not just talking about lines of code here. We're talking yeah. about shaping how technology actually integrates with society at the deepest level. Absolutely. And speaking of code, how does the EU even define an AI system in this legislation? Because let's be honest, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot. That's where things get really interesting because it's actually very nuanced. Yeah. It goes beyond just saying it processes data. The EU puts a lot of emphasis on an AI system's ability to learn, to reason, even to model its way towards whatever goals it's been given. So it's not enough for AI to just crunch numbers. It needs the potential to adapt, to actually make its own decisions based on the data it's handling. That's exactly it. Huh? It has to be about systems that can evolve, that can act, not just react. That's a really important distinction to make, and it has some pretty big implications for how we develop and use AI. So does that mean we don't have to worry about rogue AI taking over the world anytime soon? Well, let's hope not. But on a serious note, the EU clearly recognizes that not all AI is created equal when it comes to its potential impact. And that's why they've honed in on what they're calling high-risk areas, mm -hmm. places where using AI could have some really major consequences if things go wrong. We're talking health, safety, fundamental rights. Okay, so let's talk about that. High-risk AI. What exactly falls into that category, and why is it so crucial to get this right? Just imagine AI being used for things like biometric identification or managing critical infrastructure. Even certain aspects of law enforcement are in the mix here. In these areas, the stakes are incredibly high if an AI system malfunctions or isn't used responsibly. You're right. A chatbot making a weird restaurant suggestion is a very different story from an AI mismanaging air traffic control or something. Yeah. So how does the EU expect developers who are working in these high-risk areas to ensure responsibility? What sort of guidelines do they have to follow? It's not even just guidelines. It's a whole framework they've established in the AI Act. Yeah. We're talking data governance, risk management, transparency, human oversight. It's comprehensive. And there's this one detail I found really interesting. They actually delve into the specifics of the data sets that are used to train these powerful AI systems. Now, why would data sets be so important in this context? Well, think about it. The data used to train an AI system essentially shapes how it understands the world and makes decisions. The EU wants to make sure that the data used to train these high-risk AI systems is representative, it's accurate, and it's not going to perpetuate any existing biases. That's where the rubber really meets the road when it comes to building AI that's ethical and reliable. So it sounds like they're trying to build in safeguards at every single stage. Exactly. It's about getting ahead of potential issues, not just reacting after something goes wrong. And to be clear, they're not saying stop all AI development, right? No, not at all. The EU AI Act makes it clear that they are still very much committed to encouraging innovation, but it has to be responsible innovation. And that's where these AI regulatory sandboxes come in. Okay, sandboxes. What are those and what's the thinking behind them? Think of them as controlled environments. They're like testing grounds, spaces where developers can try out and refine new AI systems under the supervision of regulators. It's a way to make sure these systems actually work as intended and that they align with the EU's values before they're released to the public. So it's kind of like a proving ground for ethical AI development. Exactly. And it really underscores that the EU's isn't just focused on restrictions. They're actively trying to come up with ways to encourage responsible progress in this field. It's about creating an environment where innovation 
and responsible oversight can go hand in hand. That makes a lot of sense. Now, what about those AI models we're seeing everywhere these days, the ones that can generate text or images in seconds? Those seem particularly powerful. How is the EU approaching those? That's where I think their forward-thinking approach really shines through. They've acknowledged how big of an impact these general-purpose AI models could have, and they're already figuring out how to regulate something that's constantly evolving. It's cutting-edge stuff. I can imagine that's got to be a challenge. What makes these general-purpose models different, and what kind of unique risks do they pose? Well, the thing about these models is they're not designed for just one specific task. They're more like versatile tools, you could say, right. or even building blocks. You can adapt them for all sorts of applications. Right. Think about like a large language model, the kind that powers that chatbot you probably use all the time. Yeah. Well, that same model could be used to write poetry, translate languages, even generate computer code. Right. It's that flexibility that makes them so powerful. But it also makes regulating them a whole lot trickier. Because you can't just say, OK, this AI model is only for medical diagnoses, so it has to follow these specific medical rules if it could be used for something totally different a week later, right? Exactly. And the EU gets that. They understand that these general purpose models, especially the ones with a really broad reach, they have the potential to create what they call systemic risks. Systemic risks. Okay, that sounds a little intense. What does that actually mean when we're talking about AI? Okay, so imagine this. A general purpose AI that's being used in finance starts making loan recommendations that are biased. Okay. That bias doesn't just affect a few individuals. It could impact the entire financial system. Right. Or think about a model that's used for generating news. What if it starts spreading misinformation? You could end up destabilizing entire political systems or eroding trust in democratic processes. Wow. These are risks with huge consequences, and they can be really hard to predict or control. So it's not just about protecting individuals from harm. It's about safeguarding society as a whole from being thrown completely off balance. Exactly. And the EU's way of tackling this is to pinpoint these high-impact general-purpose models, the ones with the potential for these big risks, and then subject them to much stricter scrutiny. Okay. The companies providing these models, they'd be required to conduct thorough risk assessments, implement things to mitigate those risks, and even demonstrate that they have strong cybersecurity protocols in place. So it's kind of like saying, if you're working with this really powerful AI, you better be extra careful. Right. And transparency is a huge part of that. The AI Act, it actually requires things like detailed summaries of the data that was used to train these general purpose models. Why is it so important to be transparent about that training data, especially in these cases? Because remember, the data used to train the model is what shapes its outputs. If you train a model on data that's full of bias, guess what? It's going to reflect and even amplify those biases in its results. So these transparency requirements, they're about holding developers accountable and giving people more insight into how these really powerful systems are made. It's about understanding not just what the AI does, but the foundation it was built on. Exactly. And this is actually another place where those AI regulatory sandboxes we talked about come in. Oh, OK. So those aren't just for the strictly high risk AI systems. They're for these general purpose models, too. Yeah, for both. Mm -hmm. Think of the sandboxes as safe spaces for developers to really put these models to the test try out different data sets, tweak different parameters, all to make sure they're aligned with the EU's values and safety standards before they ever get released to the public. I'm noticing a pattern here. These sandboxes seem to be a pretty key part of their whole approach. It's a great example of how they're trying to find solutions that are practical solutions that both reduce risk and encourage responsible innovation at the same time. And it's not just about telling developers what not to do either. The EU is also taking steps to actually encourage ethical AI development. What kind of steps are we talking about here? Well, for starters, they're really pushing for more collaboration and knowledge sharing within the AI community. Okay, that makes sense. They're also providing very clear guidelines and best practices. And they're even looking into potential incentives for developers who create AI systems that have a clear benefit for society. So it's about fostering a culture of responsibility and ethical awareness from within the field of AI development itself. Exactly. And I think the EU AI Act really embodies that approach. It's about yeah. striking a balance, recognizing the huge potential of AI, but also acknowledging and addressing those potential downsides. It's a delicate dance, for sure, and only time will tell how successful the act will be in the long run. It definitely sounds like a complex and constantly shifting landscape. 
And speaking of complexity, we briefly mentioned that the EU is setting up a whole new body to oversee AI at the AI office. Can yeah. we dig into that a little bit? What exactly is the AI office and what's its role in all of this? It really does sound like they're putting together this whole ecosystem for AI, right? Yeah. From defining terms and setting the rules to making these spaces for testing and, like you said, putting some actual enforcement mechanisms in place. So tell me more about this AI office. What will it actually do? Well, the AI office is going to be absolutely essential in making sure that the AI act isn't just, you know, a bunch of words on paper. Right. Their job is to oversee how the regulation is implemented and enforced. Okay. Which means they're the ones making sure companies are actually following the rules. They'll investigate any complaints and they can actually take action when it's necessary. Take action. So does that mean they have the power to actually issue penalties if companies don't comply? Absolutely. The EU is not messing around here. They've included a really robust enforcement mechanism in this regulation. We're talking potentially hefty fines for companies that don't comply. Okay. And for those really serious violations, like ignoring those outright bans on things like those creepy social scoring systems yeah. we talked about. Yeah, those are scary. Those fines can get really steep, up to 35 million euros, or 7% of the company's global annual turnover, whichever is higher. Wow. Okay. Those are some serious numbers. It sounds like the EU is sending a very clear message that they're serious about enforcing these standards. What about violations related to, say, the stuff we talked about with high-risk AI systems? Those fines are nothing to sneeze at either. We're still talking up to 30 million euros or 6% of their global annual turnover. Wow. And it's not just about hitting them in the wallet. Authorities have the power to restrict or even completely ban the use of AI systems that they decide pose an unacceptable risk. So they could actually just shut down an AI system entirely if they think it's operating outside the rules. Exactly. The EU is definitely not afraid to use the authority this act gives them. And, you know, they do have a pretty solid track record of enforcing their regulations. So I think companies would be wise to pay attention. Yeah, I think you're right about that. It sounds like they've really thought this through from encouraging responsible development to laying out the consequences for those who just want to ignore the rules. But let's uh, zoom out for a second and look at the bigger picture. What does all of this mean for the future of AI, not just in Europe, but globally? That is the million-dollar question, isn't it? It really is. What the EU is doing here, it's pushing us to confront some really fundamental questions about how much we want AI to be a part of our lives. Mm -hmm. How do we balance all of the potential that AI has with the need to protect our fundamental rights and values? How do we make sure that AI is developed in a way that benefits everyone, not just a select few? These are questions that go way beyond national borders. These are questions that we're all going to be grappling with for years to come. It almost feels like we're standing at this crossroads and the path we choose here is going to have a huge impact on the future of AI, how it's used, how it's integrated into our world. I think that's a great way to put it. And the EU's AI Act, you know, it's a really ambitious attempt to find a path through this incredibly complex new world. And I think it's important to remember that the EU knows that this isn't a static thing. It's constantly evolving. So yeah. the legislation is designed to be reviewed and adapted as AI technology keeps developing. So it's not about setting these rigid rules that will never change, yeah. but about trying to create a flexible framework that can keep pace with how quickly AI itself is changing. Exactly. And the thing is, we're already seeing the ripple effects of this act beyond Europe. Really? Oh, yeah. As other countries are working on their own AI regulations, a lot of them are looking at what the EU has done as a potential model. I think it's safe to say that we're entering a whole new era of AI governance on a global scale, and the EU is definitely helping to lead the charge. We have covered so much ground in this deep dive. We talked about the core values at the heart of the EU's AI Act, got into the nitty gritty of how they plan to make it all work, and even touched on the potential global impact. But there's one last kind of thought-provoking question I want to leave you with. The EU AI Act, it's really focused on reducing the potential harm that AI could cause. But what about the flip side of that? How do we harness the power of AI, not just to prevent bad things from happening, but to actually do good in the world? How can we use this technology to actually strengthen our fundamental rights, to promote equality, to create a fairer and more just world for everyone? That's something I'd encourage all of us to think about as we continue to explore this complex and rapidly changing world of AI. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us for this deep dive into the EU's AI Act. Until next time, 